So in this series, we have been looking at the letters of John. We are currently in 1 John. If you have your Bible, go ahead, open it up to 1 John chapter 2. These letters are important because they ask us, okay, and give to us the most important questions that we could ever consider because it is dealing with our eternal state. Now, if you know, the Gospels were written so that we may have life in the name of Jesus so we can understand who he is, that he is the Christ, that he is the Messiah, that he is a son of God, and all who believe in him may have life in his name. The Apostle John clearly stated it in that Gospel. And now later on, as he is an old man, as he is this... um, Uh, matured pastor and he is looking at how the gospel is spreading and he now is writing letters to this church that was there and this church that is now here helping us to have assurance so that we know we have eternal life these are important things I don't know what's more important to ask ourselves than these questions how do I know that I am a believer how do I know that I have trusted Christ how do I know that I have eternal life you want to know these answers you want to know these questions so that you know beyond a shadow of any doubt that you will be with Christ forever in his glory because you are in Christ. So John writes this thing, and this is 1 John chapter 5, 13. I've mentioned it before. I'm telling us again, this is the lens in which we are viewing these letters through. It says, I write these things to you who believe, okay? This is to Christians, and most of us in here are probably Christians, right? Writing to us, those who believe in the name of the Son of God, which is Christ, so that you may know that you have eternal life. And if you've been with us, you know that we've been going through this book and we've run into a series of five different questions. Not going to go over all of those messages and those questions, but they're there for us to consider. Do I keep his commands? Do I live as Jesus did? Do I love my brothers and sisters? And there's other ones there. It's important for us to consider and then to evaluate and to recognize what God is doing in us and recognize places in which we continue to need to strive after and look towards. So John, in our passage for today, and this again is 1 John chapter 2, we're starting in verse 12, and if you don't have a Bible with you, it is on page 1054 in the Pew Bible right in front of you, 1054, 1 John chapter 2, verses 12, and we're going to go for a number of verses here. In this section, which is divided in two parts, John now turns from going from diagnostic questions we are to ask ourselves, turning now from that to giving us characteristics of those who have eternal life. So this is where John is turned, and this is the title of this message, Characteristics of Those Who Have Eternal Life. And this section, as in this book, is dense with theological truth and practical applications. And so we're going to look at this section, and I want you to consider these things. And my hope is that most of us will be assured that, yes, this is indeed true about me. This is what I'm desiring to do. This is the direction that I'm walking. And some of us, you may look at this and you say, well, mm, mm, boy, I don't, I don't, this really isn't me. And I hope that that will give you pause so that you will identify who Christ is and understand to a greater degree what he has done, who he is, what he's called us to, and what it means to follow Christ and put these things into your life by prayer and the help of the Holy Spirit and he will help you with these things. So there are six characteristics, and I know it's a lot, okay, and it makes me a little nervous, but here's the deal. That's why I give you notes to read, right? And the prayer is that that you'll be um, convicted and you'll be um, strengthened, right? And you look at these. So the prayer is, God, speak to us, speak to me. If you have that heart, I guarantee you will hear, 
Because God is present when we gather. He is present in this congregation. He is present as he's building us together in him by his spirit. So here we are. We're going to jump into the text. 1 John chapter 2, starting with verse 12. I'm going to read these three verses. We're going to talk about them. And I'm going to read the next three verses. And we'll spend some time with them as well. So here we go. I am writing to you, dear children, imagining Pastor John writing, I'm writing to you, dear children, people who are dear to him. Why? Because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Now I'm writing to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I'm writing to you, young men, because you have overcome the evil one. He's writing to these, the, the span of people. Everyone is included, both men and women, both old and young, both mature in their faith and new New in the faith, he's writing to all of us talking about some certain characteristics, okay? So he says, I'm writing to you, young men, because you've overcome the evil one. Verse 14, this is poetic as he puts these two things together. Now he repeats and says this, I write to you, dear children. Why? Because you know the Father. Now I write to you, fathers, because you know him who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men. Because you're strong, and the Word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. What's here? So let's pause and let's consider these things and ask ourselves, now, are these true of me? The first thing that we see in this passage is this. Your sins have been forgiven through Jesus. The people who are in possession of eternal life. Now, we don't have the full um, uh, inheritance right now. We have a deposit guaranteeing what is to come. We know that Holy Spirit's in our house, our, our heart, so that someday we're going to get the whole thing, right? But now we can possess eternal life, and we know that we possess it, the characteristic because your sins have been forgiven through Jesus Christ. Do you know that you're falling short of the glory of God? I hope you're going to say yes. Or some of you are like, well, I'm pretty dang good. <laughs> you're good, but you ain't God good. All right? You're not perfect. Scripture is clear. It gives us the bad news before we're introduced to the good news. We can't understand the good news without a contrast to the bad news. Right? God is perfect and he is holy and we have rebelled against him both collectively and individually. We have fallen short and the wages of sin is what? That ain't eternal life, bro. Right? Death. All of us are in bad shape <laughs> against the moral and perfect character and, of God and his righteousness and his holiness and his light. Remember, John talks about this, his glory. All of us have fallen short. And so we recognize who God is as he reveals himself to us and then we turn and walk in his light and we recognize how filthy we are in our rebellion, both big and small, to God's glory and thinking we know better. And so we come to Him in humble repentance and recognition. And when we talked about this last week, owning, two weeks ago, owning and confessing our sin. Why do we do this? Because there can be forgiveness. Where does forgiveness come from? Jesus, the Christ. Well, how can God forgive us of our sin? Because it is a problem. Because Christ took the punishment on himself for our sin. Do you understand this, right? Righteous, perfect. The righteousness of God becomes ours because Christ took our place, took our 
punishment upon him so that God's justice is satisfied and in this satisfaction of justice we can receive grace. That's the good news, right? And salvation is found in no other name. There's no other name in heaven and on earth in which we must be saved. There is no one like Jesus. No religious leader, no prophet, no mystic or religious system that the world pilfers for us to consider. Consider Christ. There is no one like him. And he offers us salvation if we would believe, put our life in him, connect to him, acknowledge him, and have our sins forgiven in Christ. This is a privilege that changes us and changes our eternity. So the bottom line for those who are having eternal life, which we call Christians, those who possess it, is first and foremost that your sins have been forgiven in Christ, right? I'm writing you, dear children, because your sins have been forgiven on account of his name. Scripture is full of all of these things. Now, the second characteristic as John is writing these things and he, we're putting them together is the second thing is you have a relationship with Christ. You see this in the first part of verse 13 and the last part of 14 when he's running through the quote-unquote fathers, which includes both men and women, because you have known him who is from the beginning. And he says this twice as he connects the importance of this. So having eternal life is, number one, connecting to Christ, having your sins forgiven, okay? This is something that we have been given. We know it mentally, and hopefully we believe it internally. Now, it goes beyond just saying, well, Christ has forgiven my sins, right? Is it now a recognition that you have an ongoing relationship, and the descriptor is very intentional, with the one who was from the beginning. Why does he use that description? He says, through Jesus or through our Lord or through the eternal one. Or He says from the beginning, right? And by the way, he says this in both the Gospel of John and also in the start of 1 John. If you would look at those passage, passages, he starts and says, that which was from the beginning, which you've heard, which you've seen with our eyes, which you look with our hands have touched, this person we proclaim to you concerning the word of life. In the Gospel of John, in the beginning, right, was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Right? He's talking about Christ who has life. So if you have eternal life, number one, you know that your sins are forgiven in Christ Jesus. Second, you know him. You talk to him. You hear from his word. You are alive with your spirit. You consider him and think of him and turn to him and live for him. His honor and his glory and his fame. And out of thankfulness of the honor to follow after him. Those who are called Christians know their sin is forgiven because they confessed it, and also know the one in whom their sin has been forgiven, which is Christ. Okay? It's important. It's important to connect with Him. It's important to commune with Him. It's important to obey Him because this is what God has designed us for and called us to. Do you have an ongoing relationship with Christ because he isn't dead, he's alive? Okay. He's alive. More alive than any of us here are. His spirit is active. And we can partner and know him. Do you know him? Talk to him. Get to know him. Understand his heart. And when you know his, when you hear his voice, you know it. Right? This is the great 
privilege that we have. And us who are grown in the faith, and these are, should be characteristics of all people in the faith, that you have an ongoing relationship with the one called Christ. Now the third thing that we observe in this passage is Pastor John is laying these things out to us in the authority of the Holy Spirit. People who have eternal life have strength to overcome the evil one. Now, did you see this as the young man, right? It said, young man, right? It says, you have overcome the evil man, the evil one. And he goes, young man, you were strong. You were strong because the word of God lives in you, and you have overcome the evil one. Not only is there a great God and perfect perfection, there is an enemy who is out to destroy God, his reputation, his glory. Okay? And because he hates God, he hates God's message. And if you are in Christ, then therefore he is against you. Do you understand this? You are secondary in his hatred. God is primary, right? And because we are connected to him, therefore we are targets by the evil one who wants to de- discredit, he wants to de-glorify, if that's a word. He wants to smear God's reputation and take what. Take from him, so to speak, if that can be done. Okay? And so there is an evil one, and Scripture talks about this, and Jesus talks about this, an enemy who prowls like a roaring lion looking for those to hang out with him. No, this doesn't work. To destroy you so that God's reputation will be destroyed and God would not get glory. And so he says, hey, hey, hey. Those who are now growing in the faith, those who are in the faith, you have overcome the evil one because you are strong. Now, were we talking about physical strength here? The answer is no, right? Be strong in the Lord and in his mighty power. What is the source of our strength to overcome the evil one? It's not your righteousness, it's the word of God, right? This is what makes us strong, the Psalms talk about this. Blessed is the man, the woman, who, who meditates on the word of the Lord. They are like a, a tree planted by streams of water, and they produce their fruit in season and out of season. When the winds come and the dryness comes, you continue to produce because your strength comes from, not from you, but from something beyond you, which is the word of God. If you want to overcome The devil. And the devil works in two primary ways. He works through mm, accusations and temptations. This is how he works, right? Accusing you of the sin you've done wrong to shame you into keeping your head down, keeping your tail down, and just, you know, being quiet, right? Devil works through accusations from what you've done in the past. He's called the accuser. And he works through temptations to try to get you to go off the path, right? And to get you ensnared and entangled in the sin. This is um, Hebrews chapter 12. And the sin that so easily entangles to make you ineffective. So he's trying to get you both ways, right? And over to overcome both temptations and accusations, you don't fight in your righteousness, you fight to the word of God. I am forgiven in Christ. Therefore, there are now no condemnation for those who are in Christ. Jesus, get behind me, Satan. You hear me, right? And that God helps us and empowers us to do all things, right? Be content in all circumstances to do what he asks us to do because he gives us the strength to do it. You must know the word of God. It's important for you and I. You're not going to be strong any other way, right? If you think, well, you know, I can you know, resist temptation on my own. You can't. Why? Because your nature is bent that way. Your new nature is not, but your mind decides. And so if you get it into your mind, it transforms how you think. It becomes true in your heart, and you start to live it out in your life. You are strong, young People, you are strong, those in the faith, because you know the word of God. That gives you strength. Do you understand this? 
So a characteristic of those who are following Christ is that you understand and meditate on his word. Now, do you, are you going to figure everything out? No, right? But you are progressing in your understanding, just like you haven't figured everything out about your spouse. You think you have, you have not, right? right? You grow in your understanding, and you now become strong in what is greater than the enemy, which is the word of God. Important to grow, and I want you to be strong because the devil doesn't take a day off. Right? He's relentless, right? tenacious. Right? And those who are just lollygagging behind, you're on the menu. <laughs> Understand this. We'll get lazy or lackadaisical. That's why scripture often um, makes an illustration that Christianity is, a, um, is like warfare, right? So this is why we have Ephesians chapter 6 about putting on the full armor of God and walking in the strength of His might, right? It says that there, right? I'm not telling you to get strong. I'm telling you to get in the Word, right? That will make you strong. And so Pastor John says, hey, 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 have strength, and you have strength to overcome the evil one, and you do. Do we do it perfectly? No. That's why we repent and come back, but we continue to move in the direction of Christ. If you fall down, you get back up. Don't give in to the, that's right. You don't give in to the accusations, right? He's going to try to trap you, right? Give in to that nonsense, Speak the word of God. That is your offensive weapon, by the way, in the armor of Christ. <laughs> Don't go after the devil with a pocket knife. You're going to lose. Boom. Helps us. And perhaps you need to grow in this. Please grow in this. It will help you. You have strength to overcome the evil one. Now, lastly, in this section, we run into this. You know the Father. So not only do those who have eternal life know the one who was from the beginning, that's Christ, but they know the Father as well. Now, John writes us in just a couple verses down, okay, in 1 John 2, 23, that whoever confesses the Son has the Father also. What's the implication being this? You can't know the Father, Father God, if you do not know the Son, you can't know the Father if you do not know the Son. Now, this is a huge statement that has serious theological implications for all of the religions of the world that reject Jesus as the Son of God. Understand this. Islam sees Jesus as a prophet, not the Son of God, but they claim to have the Father. According to Jesus' very word, if they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father. Other religions, including Judaism, that want to worship Yahweh, but reject the Son. Jesus said, if you don't have the Son, you don't have the Father. I hope you understand the seriousness of this. There are tons of religious cults and other religions that diminish the full nature of Jesus. Jesus is the cornerstone. And Jesus is the stumbling stone of people who want to come to God. If you're going to evaluate any religion, you have to ask the primary question of what do they do with Jesus? Who do you say that I am? And if it is something that is different, that is revealed in the gospel, that is revealed in scripture, reject it. This is important. And so John is saying, if you know the Son, you know the Father. And he's talking about Father God. This is true in this section. So we know that we have eternal life, that our sins are forgetting through Christ. We know if we have eternal life, if we have a relationship with Christ, we know that we have eternal life. These are characteristics. 
if we have strength to overcome the evil one. And it is a continual battle. And we know the Father through Jesus. We understand God the Father because of the, in the face of, of Jesus the Son. If you want to know who, who the Father is, look to Jesus. If you know what the Father stands for, look to Jesus. If you want to know the power of the Father, look to Jesus. You cannot have one without the other, and you cannot have God. I bless God, and many people will say this, but if they reject the Son, they don't have the Father. Serious implications. So many people think, oh, yeah, I, I'm spiritual. <laughs> the devil's spiritual. Okay. What are you doing with Christ? What are you doing with your sin? Do you actually understand who God reveals himself to be? These things are here in this first poetic section of this section of this bigger book. So let's continue on looking at the next section. This is 1 John. Now we're going to pick it up again in verse 14. We're going to read these three verses. And I just have two points in these. Right? So after staying, saying these things about characteristics of people, then he explains these two in a little fuller fashion. Verse 14, do not love the world. Or anything in the world. Now, if anyone loves the world, <clears throat> love, of the, love of the Father is not in them. For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires will pass away. <laughs> but whoever does the will of God lives forever, right? So what is this all about? <clears throat> you do not love the world. Well, wait a second, wait a second, wait a second. Didn't Jesus say, God so loved the world, right, that he gave his one and only son, right? Whoever believes in him, you, what, what, what about that? So this love is not the same as that God loves the world in the sense that he gave his son so that all could come to him through Christ, right? That love is available, and we have opportunity to proclaim that, and then all who say yes to following Jesus have eternal life. So in that sense, there is a love for our neighbor, a love for our enemy. But like Christ and what the Holy Spirit to the Apostle John is proclaiming in this saying, do not love the world. We're, we're talking about this world and its rebellion against God. It's their values and desires that are against or outside of God. And he continues to say this. This means that a person who loves the world can't get enough of the pleasures of the world. That is the lust of of the flesh. There's always a desire for more and more and more and more. I long for this stuff. This is the person who can't get enough of the things of the world. That is the lust of the eyes. And they can't get enough of the status they receive from the standards and values of the world. This is the pride of life. I like the word lust here, actually. And typically, when we think of the word lust, we think of it in a, uh, a sexual way, okay? That word actually is bigger than that. It accompanies that, for sure, but it's much larger, okay? When we think of lust for money, we say greed, right? Lust of, for power, okay? That typically expresses itself in anger and self-righteousness and self-centeredness. So this is a desire for anything that is less of God, that this, less than God, that this world offers to us. And it offers us a lot of stuff, right? You have a car? Here's a new car, right? Do you have some clothes? Here's some nice clothes, right? Do you have skin? But here's how do you get better skin, right? I know you're popular, but if you do this, you could be more popular, right? 
and on and on and on. If you are living to get as much status and much pleasure and much of quote-unquote life this life offers you, you are not following Christ. You are loving the world more than you're loving God. Now, can you enjoy the things of the world? Sure, right? God gives us all things to enjoy, but does it capture you? Is that what you're living for, right? Is that what you love more than God, your affections are perverted. They're upside down, right? I enjoy watching sports, but if I had to choose between my team and God, I'm encouraging God every time, right? I love my family, and I love you all. But if I had to choose between God and y'all, you're losing. <laughs> same with my wife. Same with my children. Where is our affections? Where is our love? And you say, well, if you love the Lord, excuse me, the world more than the Father, you don't love the Father. We have to look at that. Right? And when you love something, you give yourself to it. Time, attention, focus. Right? I know people that love their sports team. And they think about their sports team. And they can tell you all the stats of their sports team. And they know when they're going to play. And they can tell you the game that happened in 1964 and who won and how many yards their team got. Right? <laughs> can you tell me five Bible verses? <laughs> Jesus wept. That's one. <laughs> God so loved the world. You understand how this looks, right? If you have affection towards someone or something, you think about it, you turn to it, you consider it in your choices, you give it your time and you invest in it because you love it. Everything in this world is going to fail you. Temporary. Don't spend your life decorating your hotel room and living for your hotel room because that ain't your eternal home. It's somewhere else. This is what he says. Right? This world and its desires will what? Pass away. So if you have eternal life, why are you living all about now? Why aren't you giving of yourself and going to places and doing things that matter for eternity because that's going to be your reality forever, right? So don't be hooked into all of the things that this world tells you to do and tells you to love and tells you to be and to be about. People are living all for the world, but yet they say they love God. They don't love God. Dave, that's legalistic. No, that's reality. Are you captured and by whom are you captured? Do not love the world because it's passing away and if it has hooked you, ask God to cut the strings and to remove the hooks so you can be free for real eternal life and with real freedom. The last point is this. You do the will of God. You see this right here in the, in the end? The world and its desires pass away. But whoever does the will of God lives forever. Do you get up in the morning and ask yourself, God, what is your will for me today? Right? That's a really good question. Right? Now, if you ask yourself this, you're now saying that you are desirous and conscious of and want to follow God's will for you today. Well, how do you know his will? Of course, number one, you get into his word and you read it. You memorize it so that you are clear on some things ultimately that we are to do. Proclaim his name, to live for Christ, to resist temptation, to flee from the devil, to love our neighbors and ourselves. Okay, we know these things. God, help me to do this today. If you orientate yourself that way, that's the best way to live as a Christian. What is your will today? Right? 
We live like Christ, the one whom we follow, who said, not my will, but yours be done. And Jesus, while he was living, he said, I only do what I see my Father doing. God, help us to have that clarity, right? Because I don't always have it. And so, if you have a desire, you say, God, help me to understand. And you think about your decisions based upon the grid of his word. saying, what is the best? And then you do things that are crazy. Like, go be a missionary in Kenya, right? Crazy. Why would you do that? You don't understand who I am following. And you don't understand what I'm living for. It's way beyond. Makes sense through the lens of eternity. Makes no sense through the, through the lens of temporality. If you have eternal life, view your life through the lens of eternity, you will live differently. These characteristics. Okay? So I'm coming in for a landing. Okay? And so as we think about this passage, I know it's a lot. Please go back. Go back to this, this book. Read ahead, okay? No surprises. I want you to know this stuff. Thank you for coming up. That's great, okay? Look at all of this, right? We had a prearranged signal, and she got the signal. <laughs> Way to go. You're the bestest, okay? <laughs> Think about this. This is super important, right? I understand that there's games on today, right? I'm going to watch one, right? Or maybe two. <laughs> okay. But don't let this stuff go. Please hear me. Please hear me. Okay. It's good to laugh. I like to. But it's important. Consider the question. Consider these characteristics. Examine yourself and ask God, God, help me. I don't want you to be free of accusations and temptations and have the peace of knowing that Christ is in you and you are in Christ. And you have eternal life. And someday if I'm on the side of your bed when you take your last breath here and take your first breath in eternity, there will be great joy that you said to live as Christ Let that capture you. Look at Christ, what he's done. The privilege we have to follow him. And that is my prayer for us. So God, here we are this morning. Father, I've done my best. And Lord, do what is way beyond any preacher. Work in our hearts. God, so grateful for so many here who have lived and are living for Christ. God, help us to see them and to know them and to learn from them. Help us to build each other up. God, for us who are just thinking about these things, God, will you make it clear to us? You are our gentle shepherd. You are our great redeemer. You are the Lord of lords. You are the faithful one, and you talk to us. Father, speak to us as a congregation. Make us, God, and just open the doors of this place, of my heart, of our hearts, if I can do that. God, do your work among us here so that the nations will be glad, so that people will have eternal life and enjoy you both now and forever. So do your work in us, God personally, corporately. Help us to see, to follow, to treasure, to content the things that matter most. God, thank you for an opportunity to know you and to partner with the world. God, thank you. Uh, and seeing the re world redeemed, thank you for your goodness and your grace to us. Because though our sins are many, your mercy is more. We praise you for these things in Jesus' name. Amen.